So welcome, I'm Brian Price, board member of the Dallas Way. We are proud to present, in conjunction with LULAC Rainbow Council number 4871, Our Stories, Our History, This Is Us, a roundtable discussion on the history of the Latino LGBTQ community in Dallas. The mission of the Dallas Way is to gather, organize, store, and present in a variety of media the complete GLBT history of Dallas, Texas. Before we continue, I would like to introduce uh, Lex Trevino, uh, representing Lulac Rainbow Council and Deputy District Director from District 3 to say a few words about the organization. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. It is an honor and a privilege to be here to, um, to hear this story. Um, this is our past and you know it's leading into our future. So uh, 4871 is actually the first Rainbow Council in LULAC. Um, we're going on our 12th year. Uh, Rainbow Council means that we're an LGBT specific council. Um, when we started 12 years ago, we were the only one. We kind of struggled to get people to take the officers because nobody wanted to be there. And now, 12 years later, we have 13 councils throughout um, the United States. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And we have a council that's coming together in Rio Grande Valley. We have a council that's coming together in Austin, Texas. So we continue to grow in numbers, and we're really excited. We're especially excited to be here um, to hear this amazing story. So thank you. Today, we're here to listen to the stories and history of the LGBTQ Latino, Latina, Latinx communities of Dallas. Uh, this is part one of a three-part series focusing on the history of traditionally underrepresented communities within the broader Dallas LGBTQ history. In June, we will present a roundtable discussion on the black LGBTQ community in Dallas. And in August, we will present a roundtable discussion on transgender history in Dallas. Those dates are on the back of your program, and their locations will be announced in the coming weeks. In addition to putting on these roundtable discussions, we intend to use these forums as opportunities to leverage new partnerships in the collecting and sharing of history. In this case, we are partnering with Lulac Rainbow Council. We will work with them and others who have begun this work, such as Jesus Cherie's, to find more collections that need preserving and more individual stories within the Latino LGBTQ community in Dallas expanding on the many collections and stories collected thus far by the Dallas Way since 2011. In just a minute, I will introduce Chris Luna, our moderator for the evening, who will introduce our panelists, including Jesus Cherise, who has joined us all the way from Mexico City. But first, I wanted to take a moment to reflect on why discussions like tonight's are so important for the community. If today we tell our stories, we record them, we begin new partnerships to archive and share this history because we know that if we don't, no one else will. My friend Dr. Steve Sprinkle reminded me the other day that the history of LGBTQ lives throughout all of history, human history, has been episodic and hidden at best and closeted. We also know that when we speak of history, we are speaking of and discovering our present. James Baldwin once said, history is not about the past, history is about the present. It comes as no surprise to most of the audience today that Dallas, the Dallas LGBTQ community faces fragmentation and even at times conflict along racial, ethnic, and gender lines. We see these divisions in our bars, our organizations, our social circles, and our history. These divisions, of course, reflect the broader city of which we're a part. Dallas is geographically and quantitatively one of the most segregated cities in the country along racial and ethnic lines. While flyering for this event, my fellow board member Nino and I had a conversation with a cashier at a local business in Oak Lawn. He said he'd only been in Dallas for a few years, but noticed it odd that most every group that came into his store was all one color or another, one gender or another. He tried to engage people about it, he said, to figure out why this is, and they apparently had nothing to say about it. It wasn't noteworthy to, noteworthy to them that it's become so normalized that it's just a part of the ocean in which we all swim. Part of the problem, of course, is that many of us don't really even have the tools or the space to discuss this. Some have said that the LGBTQ community isn't really one community, but several. That the use of the term community is more of a fiction, even if sometimes a useful one. Perhaps, though, what brings us together is our appreciation and our affirmation of difference. Difference brings us together, it is the source of our identity, and it is inherently disruptive to the status quo. Tonight, we listen to the stories of Jesus, Chris, Jose, Michael, and Yanessa. Telling our stories is and always has been a subversive act. 
all the more when we highlight the stories of communities within the community that have extra layers of social meaning or of history of neglect by mainstream society. When we create a space like this, we listen to the stories of each other. We are made stronger as this community of communities and as individuals. Like the way a song can offer you inspiration, faith, or hope in times of need, stories of the past can remind us of times we stood up for ourselves and for others, when we took care of each other. They can give us hope and courage today. Tonight, we hope that the LGBTQ community can become, in spaces like this, a force of dialogue, of creativity, and ultimately of change and justice for Dallas and beyond. Towards that end, I'm going to introduce our moderator for the evening, Chris Luna, who will be leading the discussion. Chris is Vice President of Legal Affairs for Metro PCS. Chris was elected to three terms on the Dallas City Council, and during that time, he appointed a record number of LGBT residents to city boards and commissions. He has also served on the board of several LGBT organizations, including the Texas Human Rights Foundation, Oakland Community Services, AIDS Arms, Turtle Creek Corral, and Black Tie Dinner. He has also served on the boards of several Latino organizations, including the Dallas Hispanic Law Foundation, the President's Hispanic Advisory Council at the University of Texas at Arlington, and the Dallas Hispanic PAC PAC. Chris has also, by the way, already been featured uh, and spoke at one of the Dallas Ways outrageous oral events. Let's give a welcoming hand to Chris Luna and our panelists for the evening. So a couple of things. Even though we're in a church, we're not going to pass the plate at the beginning. <laughs> okay? And second, um, as somebody who works for a cell phone company, it pains me when somebody says, please silence your cell phones. It just is like a, a knife through my heart. So um, we're going to introduce the panelists, and the panelists' bios are in the brochure that you picked up. But I'm, I want to talk about it because it's their perspective. It's their background. It's their history. So when they make the remarks or comment, you'll understand the lens they're, they're looking through and their history and the background. Uh, and the other thing I thought about the panel is, is you know, with marriage equality, I thought this was almost like the perfect um, uh, gay marriage panel. It's someone borrowed, someone knew. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all rainbow. So, so even, OK. So at the very end is Jose Plata. Uh, Jose, who was called Dallas home for the past 38 years, is the 10th of 11 children born to migrant farming Mexican immigrants. He and his siblings are first generation born US citizens from Northeast Texas. He and his siblings, oh, sorry, I already said that. As a professional classroom teacher political activist, Jose left an indelible mark on Dallas, most notably on our Dallas public schools and Dallas ISD. Where he, was, where he was an elementary classroom teacher, and after leaving the classroom, was elected by the voters uh, in Dallas ISD District 7 as their trustee and board member to the Dallas Independent School District Board of Trustees. Uh, Jose is also very well known as the Queen of Oak Cliff. Hey. I don't know if he inherited the title or bought it, so you can ask him afterwards. <laughs> exactly. Next to Jose is uh, Jesus Chavez. Jesus is a writer, artist, and activist. He was the founder and first president of the Gay Hispanic Coalition in Dallas. He was the producer and host of, USA, of the USA's first LGBT Latino radio show, Sin Fronteras, on KNON, and LULAC 4871, the Dallas Radio Council. Started, started a scholarship in his name, the Jesus Chavez Scholarship Fund. As mentioned, he now resides in Mexico City. Next to Jesus is James Michael Dominguez, uh, who is Assistant Vice President at Plains Capital Bank. Originally from Corpus Christi, uh, Michael moved to Dallas in 2014 from Austin. His work in community activism and volunteerism began while working at Wells Fargo Bank. Uh, at Wells, he was President of the Employee Pride Committee for two years, and he also served two years as President of their Diversity Council. After moving to Dallas, some of you probably read about this and saw on TV, uh, uh, survived a near fatal attack on the streets of Cedar Springs. Once healed, Michael has become an outspoken advocate and activist for safety in the Dallas LGBT community. Next to me is Yonessa Romero. Uh, Yonessa is a licensed minister and pastor of Catedral de la Esperanza, 
a Spanish-speaking worship community with a focus on the LGBT, Latino, and Latina Christians. She has been a member of Cathedral of Hope since 2010. She has a Bachelor in Science in Economics and an MBA. Kind of an interesting combination, theology and MBA. Maybe she'll talk about that. Uh, and she's currently working on a Master's of Theology degree. She's a member of the United Church of Christ Council of Static Ministries, a national organization of Latino and Latina clergies. So with that background, everybody has a coming out story. And the thing I like about coming out stories is they're all different. So the first question to the panelists, and to kind of put things into perspective, is if you would share with our audience tonight your coming out story uh, in terms of being a gay man or a lesbian woman. Jose, do you want to start at the very end? Or do you want to go to Jesus? <laughs> Um, what was that? What did we discuss about time? So, um, that's a good question. Um, so if I'm looking at my watch, it's not that I'm bored. I'm trying to keep people on time. I'm trying to get treasure on time. Two to three minutes is kind of... All right. Um, because we're going to touch the other stuff a little bit later, I'm sure. But my coming out story I have has to do with my classroom, professional classroom teacher life. Um, I got involved in the gay and lesbian, uh, the DGLA, or the DGA, actually, way back then, as a volunteer and worked with uh, the whole group of people that helped make me. Um, and I think one of the things that occurred is that they had a, a big uh, conference here in Dallas, and I went and volunteered. The TV cameras were there. And the next day, sitting at the table over lunch, my teachers, we saw you on TV. I said, didn't I look great? <laughs> yeah. But the other big one is what we had to endure uh, as leaders back then to try to do and continue doing good for this community. I ran for school board, and I will tell you that I will end it by saying this. It was incredible. Um, it was an awesome experience. I wouldn't do it again, not in that manner. But I want to just read you something, and I'll turn it over. And this is an editorial that appeared in back then in the, in the Oak Cliff Tribune. And it's, it's long, but I'm just going to read the intro. After seven months without representation, District 7, you're sitting in District 7. It was my district. Uh, it finally has a voice again on the Dallas School Board. Jose Planta edged out Jim Salinas by 51 votes in a runoff election that could be described as one of the nastiest school board races Oak Cliff voters have ever seen. And, and, and we'll come back to some of that ugliness in terms of the history. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Uh, well, my coming out story is that you know I was I moved off Plum. Well, I had a lover for six years, and we split up, and I moved off Plum. I kind of thought I was out, but really I wasn't out. You know, this is before the internet, so you could hide. Uh, <laughs> But, but then I did the weekend experience in October 1986, and that was an awakening because um, Robert Eichberg uh, had, it was talked about how important it was to come out. And because if more people came out, then we would give us power. Uh, after I did the weekend, I did tell my parents or my mother that I was gay. And the first thing, well, I told her I was special. She said, oh, I know you're special. You're always coming out in the newspapers and stuff because I was an activist. I was uh, working with uh, LULAC and uh, Mexican-American Business and Professional Women and, and the Hispanic, well, it used to be the Mexican Chamber of Commerce before it was the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And, and so I would, I would have some vis visibility that way. And she says, oh, I know you're special. I said, no, 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 you know, special, special. And she started to cry. And I told her, I mean, the words came out, and I was gay. And she started crying. And she said, you're going to burn in hell. And so she kept saying, you're going to burn in hell. And I told her, I said, you know, God loves me. God made me. I'm not going to burn in hell. And so, you know, I told her during a lunch break, I actually had been sweating about talking about it. I had left my office. Uh, I was working for the Federal Communications Commission at the time, so I drove home, I took, drove to her house to tell her that, and then, you know, I had to get back to the office. And um, 
you know, I, you know, and then when I came home, she had cooked me a special meal, she had bought my special stuff, and I was telling a friend of mine that, you know, how she was treating me special, and she said, well, this because she probably thought something was wrong with you and wanted to treat you right. But then I told my brothers and sisters, and really everybody knew, everybody knew, you know, uh, the only person who didn't know was me. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I would have two parties when I was younger. I would have a gay party and I would have a straight party. But of course, you know, after I came out, my first party, you know, I invited everybody and I had it on the, I had it in the bar in Oak Lawn and, you know, family was there and stuff. And one of the things that was really important after that was that my mother, one time, I remember, it was an election, and I forgot who, who was, uh, I think it was Clayton Williams, because you know, we're talking, you know, way back on and, um, and she said, well, I'm not going to vote for him. He hates gay people, oh. you know, and that was power. Michael? Uh, my coming out story, I was two months into uh, my 18th year. I grew up in a very strict Pentecostal Assemblies of God household. My grand, my step-grandfather was the pastor of our church in Aransas Pass, Texas, population 7,852. My stepfather was the associate pastor, and I was about as active as you could possibly be in the church. I, I was a preacher's kid. I was at camp every single summer. I led praise and worship at my private school. Uh, I was at uh, any, any imaginable revival mission trip. I was there. And I remember when I was younger, I was in, I want to say, fourth or fifth grade. And as any kid does, you, you see social cues around you, and boys were kissing girls on the playground, and this was kind of the norm. And I remember just kind of asking, you know, why, why are you guys doing that? What's going on? It's like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so likes so-and-so. He likes her, and that's why they're doing it. And so in my mind, I equated that to, okay, cool. I remember his name was Derek, and we were on the playground, and I very nonchalantly just went up and kissed him. And immediately was ridiculed by everybody. That's gross. That's gross. Boys don't kiss boys. I don't understand. Whole big thing. I was, it was at the principal's office. They called my parents. And I just remember my mother saying, boys don't kiss boys. They don't kiss boys. So on well, the next week, I went back to school. I kissed a girl on the playground. Same uproar. That's gross. I didn't tell you. And I was just so confused. I was like, well, who, who am I supposed to be kissing? <laughs> I can't kiss who I want to kiss. Well, fast forward to... Uh, Three days after my 18th birthday, being sheltered, not really knowing, I, I went out to a gay bar in Corpus Christi, Texas. I drove 35 minutes in my 1987 blue Chevy Malibu. Uh, the thing had no AC, but I, I, it was my ticket to freedom. And I remember walking into the bar, it was 9.15 at night. It was me, three bartenders, and one other guy in there. And I parked myself into a corner with my Dr. Pepper, and I sat there. And I just observed. And as people started walking in, I remember feeling this overwhelming sense of it was almost anxiety mixed with this is where I'm supposed to be, though. I'm around people like me. And so I would go every couple of weekends, and I ran into my cousin. I saw him on the dance floor, and everybody in our family knew he was gay. It was the, the untold secret. But there was this feeling of, oh my God, I'm going to be found out going to be out, but I have to get out of this space. And as I get up to leave, I hear my name, Michael. And I turn around and he's staring at me and he has this black collared, like see-through mesh shirt on. And he's with this guy, my 18 year old, this guy is beautiful that you were with. And he says, come here. And he gives me the biggest hug. And he said, let me introduce you to some friends. I'm so happy to see you. So he and I went out every single weekend for the next two to three months, and, and I, it, I was enjoying it. I was going to school, I was working full time. And I think that at that point, after spending so much time with my cousin, who everybody knew was gay, my parents knew. Where do you guys go on the weekends? What do you guys do? And I remember I met a boy at a bar, and I drove him to his school at Texas A&M Kingsville, which was another 45 minutes away from Corpus Christi, so that makes it about an hour and a half away from where I live, in my 1987 blue Chevy Malibu. <laughs> and on the way back, the car overheated because, of course, as an 18-year-old little queer kid, I don't know the first thing about vehicles. So I had to call my parents from a payphone 
And my dad had to drive to Kingsville to pick me up. And I remember sitting in the car on the way home and he was just asking, what, what are you doing out here? And I don't even remember the story that I made up that involved the guy that I brought home and his girl, uh, or his, his friend who was a girl, and the girl had a crush on me, so I was, we were just kind of all hanging out. And I mean, he knew. I'm, I'm horrible at lying as it is. <laughs> he knew, and we get home, and I remember a couple hours later, I'm just in the living room, and him and my mom sit down and said, we need to have a conversation. And I feel, I carry around a lot of anger about this because I feel coming out is a very personal thing. It's a powerful thing. It takes a lot of people, a lot of years to come to terms and find the courage to be able to, one, <clears throat> find that truth with themselves and come at peace with that. And then two, be able to very um, strategically pick the people that you allow into that part of your life. And so to have that power and that opportunity taken away from you and you were forced with the two most important people of your life asking you, are you gay? I remember sitting there in complete silence for 45 minutes and the three of us just sat there without a single word. My brother and my two sisters were in their rooms. And we're not allowed to come out. And finally I said, yes. And my mother started crying and immediately my father said, this isn't supposed to happen. Parents aren't supposed to bury their kids. You're, you're going to die of AIDS. And I remember hearing that from my father, just like, that, that's not, you know, you have so many emotions. My mother's crying, you know, Jesus doesn't want you to be gay. You know, we don't want you to go to hell and all of this, all of this. And, and it ended with a lot of tears and with them saying, you can't be gay if you're going to live in our home. <laughs> They didn't essentially kick me out, but I think all of us here know what it's like to feel unwanted in a space and, and to have the environment changed where you're almost forced out of necessity. So I left and I didn't speak to my parents for about a year and a half, didn't see them for about a year, didn't speak to them for about a year, didn't see them for about a year and a half. Our relationship now is fantastic and hopefully we'll get some time to touch on that, but it took a lot of honest conversations over time to heal and, and I can say right now their viewpoints on stuff are <laughs> evolving at a rapid rate to the point where my dad who's still a pastor will call me and say this kid in my youth group just came out to me and he wants to become a member and he's the most active kid in our youth group right now and I don't know what to say to this kid and he's asking me the kid he told who was going to die of AIDS how should I proceed with this young man's spiritual journey and so I think uh, there's still a lot of hurt there. There's a lot of unsaid conversations, but I think it made me into kind of the activist that I am because you were forced to be strong at a time when you're not necessarily able to. And being able to recognize that in other people and being able to step in and say, let me shoulder some of this burden. Let me be the strength when you can't be. I think that that's kind of been extremely formative in the person that I am right now. And we're going to touch on religion and faith in another question. So, um, you know, let's, talk, let's talk about your experience. Um, uh, yes. Um, well, my coming out experience, it was in some sort of uh, pick and choose to whom I was coming out. Because uh, I first discovered my, uh, my interest in women when I was in college. I, at, at first, I, I thought I was straight. You know, I explored with boys. But during my college years, I was invited to a feminist class. I was in a, liber in a liberal uh, college, and they had this feminist class that include uh, stories about gender and about sexual orientation and so on. So for the first time in my life, because I was, I was raised in a Catholic school and a very conservative family, I was exposed to so many options about sexuality. And I came to this group of women uh, that were so great to be around when uh, these ideas about all the possibilities to, to engage in relationships and that was very appealing to me when I was 17, 18 years old. So I became uh, uh, straight into exploring what was this thing about to, to be a lesbian, a brand new lesbian. And in that uh, group, uh, I remember those days we started a little uh, newspaper project with, um, with other three, uh, few women uh, to come with ideas about you know, Simone de Beauvoir and about what was the term of lesbianism and, 
and all of these kind of socialistic uh, approach about lesbianism. But I did not come out through my family. Uh, later on, I didn't come out uh, through my work environment. It took me a long process to really uh, be in public uh, as, as a lesbian woman. Uh, my parents always knew and uh, kind of uh, my color story remind me uh, when the situation started to become more visible in my family, uh, already with a job uh, and the, uh, the security of, of some income, I decided to abruptly leave my home and start living by myself. And uh, being part of a conservative uh, family in which I was the only daughter, it was a big thing for my family that I was leaving the house, I was uh, breaking the dream to be married uh, with a white dress and with a nice guy in good social position. So uh, they, they were heartbroken. But uh, even say that, I maintain my my commitment, my desire to be free, and I continue engaging. And later on, uh, my mother support me, even though we never had the chance to, uh, she passed away, but we never had the chance to have a, a conversation about my coming out in the way that I would like to. Even though I found one time a paper that she was researching about lesbos, and the <laughs> island of lesbos. So that tells me that she was really uh, into what was uh, what was happening with this daughter that they was hanging out with these strange women. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, but my story later, I can, I can tell some things about my participation uh, as an active lesbian here in the community of so. Paris. And, and I can relate because you said that about marrying a, a good guy, a good social upbringing uh, background. That's what I did. I met, I met a good guy with a, a good social background. <laughs> So I can relate, I can relate. Okay, so this question is for Jose and Jesus, uh, because I want to go back a little bit to the early years, uh, and then we'll ask a question for our other two panelists in more recent times. Um, in the early LGBTQ experience in Dallas, I want to talk about some of the early organizing and early barriers that were faced. And Jose, you kind of touched on yours a little bit about your race as a very public campaign to put your name on the ballot and, and that experience. Um, and of course, as you're a leader in uh, the radio community and starting things and, and doing things uh, there, uh, and, and, and I guess I first met you as an artist. So, so t tell me about, about some of the early years, barriers. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to say discrimination per se, but if that's part of the story, but um, early barriers in your experience as being um, a Latino in, a gay Latino in Dallas. Hey, this is a writer. He's probably writing a story. Right? He's probably writing a story or a blog post as we're talking. So, um, you know. um, one of the things that I never let get in front of me was a barrier. I'm sorry. Um, one that I, I, I did not participate. You know, if I felt I was not wanted in terms of me giving service to the community in all kinds of ways, I didn't do it. I went elsewhere and offered my service to people who appreciate it. Um, I am spiritual. I believe in God. Um, and I'm one of the people uh, in a longer bio uh, that, that I have. It says that I was here. I, I think I know my purpose, and that is to help mankind and, and, and help people. Um, barriers are things like walls, right? And um, I never thought that everything we did to break those barriers, that we would see what the time and temperament that we're in currently. It is sad. It, 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 you know, what I think what you're saying is the experience of what we should have, I'm saying I didn't have back then, I'm feeling it now. And it's ugly. It, it's it's uh, because I, I worked really hard as a person and made myself, I did not join leadership groups, I did not do anything. I did it as a classroom teacher, as a student organizer with the NEA. I was sent to Dallas to be a teacher and an organizer here, and I worked my ass off to get to where I am. And, and, and I, I proved to people that it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. It has nothing to do with um, what 
where you came from, all of those things. It has to do with how much you're willing to give and what you're willing to do. I didn't always agree with people who were there, um, I, I, but I did follow through and offer my best suggestions and participated a lot uh, in, in order to know the history that we were able to produce and to put forth some very good things in line that I'm hoping these young people today are going to take advantage of and I'm glad that they are. Um, and before I lose that opportunity, my life, in terms of public service and as an elected official, because there's another public service that doesn't have to be elected, um, it was chronicled in a book called Trailblazers, The Profiles of America's Gay and Lesbian Elected Officials. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ken Yeager came to Dallas, interviewed me, and I happened to be chapter seven. For the, I just noticed that today, because I pulled it out and read it again just to refresh the damn story in my head. Uh, there's some things you try to leave behind you, but there's some very good things in here in terms of other profiles across this nation of people like you and me and what, what they, we all work to build, and, and I'm sure these, this is continued. I want to quote, uh, I think it's the lady in San Antonio this week, she's leaving as fire chief. Um, and she said, they, they call me a trailblazer. I'm glad I'm that, but I'm hoping that I, there will be more after me because I, I, th th if I did something to pave the way, good, but I want them to take advantage of it. Your question again, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so, so in the early years, any barriers or problems you experienced in you're either organized, an activist, organizing, or been an artist, radio person, uh, to try, try to give folks a feel for, in those old days, some of the barriers and problems that we, we had to so overcome. Include radio as well. Well, <clears throat> let me say that um, when I thought being gay was, was being gay, we were all family, we were all a community, and I really didn't see myself as um, being discriminated against. Um, uh, I got a job uh, in, my, in my job where I started working so in the mail, in the mail room I met a guy and <clears throat> we ended up living together. I didn't even know about the Oak Lawn or anything like that and we were together for six years and, and then he, um, we, we split up um, in um, December 31st, 1979. That was my New Year's Eve present from him. And, uh, and so I, we, I was living in Little Forest Hills. I decided to move to Oak Lawn and, um, because I, I, found it, I thought it was safe haven. And I, um, because I was used to the second income, I had to work, so I did a, a part-time job. I got a part-time job as a cashier at, at Mary Thumbs on Cedar Springs, um, which was, you know, we called it Mary Thumbs, but it was Tom Thumb. You know, so. <laughs> And, and I met a guy, and he asked me to meet him um, and to have a drink at Frontboard Mining Company. So I said, fine, I get off of work. And so I went home, got ready, and I went to Frontboard Mining Company. And I was not allowed to go in the bar because I didn't have enough ID. And, um, and that was a shocker to me because, um, wow. And, and because um, this was before cell phones, I would, and this was in August of 1980, I, um, and they had the door open, and I, I did walk away. I stepped to the side of the, the doorway, and the, and the cashier said, um, that's what you told me, he was talking to his coworker, and he said, that's another Mexican down. Oh. And I was horrified, you know, wow, you know. And, and I, I went in the bar, and I said, I heard you, blah, blah, blah. And he said, get out of here, we're gonna call security, and you know, get you arrested. So I left, I was, um, you know, I was, I was, you know, it, that was a, a wild experience. Um, and the next day, because I worked at Mary um the DGA was doing heavy recruitment. They had a table at the um, at Tom Thumb, and Don Baker was at the table. And I knew who he was, and I knew about the DGA. And I told him about my experience. He wasn't interested. They didn't see it as a gay problem. He didn't see it as a problem at all. He gave me the phone number to Charlie Hunt. Charlie Hunt is uh, one of the owners of JR's and Front Morning Mining Company, well, Cabin Enterprises. 
And so he said, call him and see if maybe he can help you. And I was like, wow. And I said, you know, but he's, these people, these people at the cashier are doing what he's asking them to do, so this is not going to be any good. And because I wasn't ever felt I was discriminated against, I didn't have any um, uh, experience with working with the Latino community. I, uh, I wasn't a part of LULAC, I wasn't a part of the American GI Forum, I wasn't a part of any of that. And because I didn't feel like I got anywhere, <clears throat> I ended up joining LULAC. I ended up joining other Latino organizations. In fact, I helped form an organization, a network of Hispanic communicators, because I worked for the Federal Communications Commission. And through those organizations, I learned the skills of organizing. And so in 1982, uh, some, some friends um, finally met other Latinos, and we formed um, a gay Latino organization, the Gay Hispanic Coalition, the Dallas. And, and that, was, that was interesting because you know, I didn't have any experience in running an organization and nobody had any experience in being in such an organization. It was like nobody could tell you what they wanted, they could only tell you what they didn't like. And they didn't like a lot of stuff I was doing. So. And so it was, it was tiring, but, but there was a Houston group. And so the Houston group, one time, oh, and I was the phone number for the, um, <clears throat> for the gay group, and one time we got a, a message from Houston, uh, the gay group, the gay uh, Hispanic caucus, and they left a message, we're coming to see y'all, you're gonna put us up for the weekend. <laughs> and so, you know, and so we waited for them to come to Dallas, and uh, we had a really good weekend, and so we formed a coalition between Dallas and Houston. And then, uh, as we grew, we, uh, I would, because of my travels, I would, um, I would go to El Paso, and I met uh, some of these uh, uh, Lisbon Latina women that uh, had a magazine, so we, we got them involved. And so we ended up forming a, a, a coalition of, of uh, we call it Tejanos, uh, Gay Tejanos de uh, Tejas. And so we formed a coalition between organizations Dallas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and El Paso. And we formed, um, um, yeah, we, we formed a group and we would have HIV uh, 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 prevention, um, fighting, fighting the, um, the discrimination. And, and two, because of the, uh, the Dallas group, it was all, it, we all did everything in English. I remember one time we had somebody come in to the organization that didn't speak any English, and spoke in Spanish, and I thought that was weird, you know? Um, <laughs> You know, and because we didn't do anything bilingual, but we ended up, um, you know, accommodating and, uh, and, and, uh, and and working with that. We we did have a gay councilman at the time, but we had um, Ricardo Medrano. He was on the he was on the Dallas City Council. And he represented Oakland, and and he would come to the meetings. Roberto uh, Medrano, which is his brother, he was on the uh, Dallas School Board, and. Um, they would come to the meetings and things like that. And so we, um, uh, and, and through Ricardo Medrano, we were able to, uh, he was appointing um, gay people, gay Latinos on boards and commissions. So, and, you know, that we did it that way. All of our mailings were, were secret. You know, we couldn't have anything on the outside of the envelope that indicated it was gay or anything like that. And, um, you know, the organization, we stayed until 1988, and we lasted until 1988, and then we kind of, everything went dark. Um, one of the things, when I did come out in 86, I went to Mexico. Oh, I was, back then, I was Jesse Cherez as well. Um, and I went to Mexico, and I said, you know, I went to Mexico City. Have you ever been there? Yeah, it's a mega city, it's really wonderful. And I said, oh my God, I've been lied to. You know, this is a beautiful country. You know, it's a beautiful people and everything. So I came back as Jesus Chavez. And I pretty much left all organizations and got back into my art. And, and when I did that, uh, I kind of, you know, wasn't organized. I, I moved to Oldies, Dallas and opened up an, an art space on Bennett Avenue. And you would go to the art shows. Um, um, uh, Chris would go and everything, and, and I got popular doing the art stuff. And then um, Mark McNeil, who was the general manager of KNON, offered me a job as um, uh, doing a radio show called a uh, gay Latino radio show called Sin Fronteras. Uh, one of the reasons Mark McNeil offered me a job there was because uh, I was kind of could be the uh, voice of KNON. 
because I had just left the Federal Communications Commission. I couldn't have a conflict of interest, so I was offered a, 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 a volunteer work, and I started the radio show and on, on the Sunday, 4th of July, 1993, and uh, it was an hour, and um, I did that. It was all in English, and but um, what happened with that is that um, after after the first couple of months, I ran out of gay Latinos to interview because of, because of back in 1993, a lot of people were still in the closet, uh, Latinos were. And so I started to play music, and, uh, and, and so uh, the radio show got popular. We were, uh, Max Nunez, who sit back there, um, say, wait, Max, he was my first volunteer assistant to help me on the radio show. He told me he was 19, but he was only 17. <laughs> Okay, we're going to stop there. <laughs> we'll stop there. Like, oh, we didn't do that. Oh, like, hey, we're just been tight. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, we got to be bigger friends. I mean, I, I told him I was 36, but I was 42. So, <laughs> so, so, we, yeah. so we lied. We lied. We lied. Everybody lied. And so, so. But then the radio show got popular. And it has it mentioned, when, I, when we had the gay groups, so we didn't have any... Uh, Spanish speakers, but it turned out I was getting a lot of Spanish immigrants listening to the radio show, and uh, and it was interesting because a lot of the um, gay people that would listen to my show would do it and would would use headphones, so would go in the closet and listen to it. They would get in the car to listen to it. So I thought that was interesting, and because a lot of people were calling me, uh, and I was speaking more Chicano uh, stuff, but you know Spanglish, but then is more. I started dating more Mexicans, so uh, you know my, my Spanish improved. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, we did that. I did that for 12 years, and I was like a long ranger. I would, there, there was no, you know, the the um, the Hispanic Coalition had died in 1988. I started the show in 4th of July 1993, and I did that for a long time until uh, they started a, a, a Valiente, a, a gay Latino group. I think it was in 2004, and but uh, but by then I was getting tired of the radio show and, and, and stuff. But you know, Max, uh, whenever I would go to Mexico, we would do live feeds from you know, do interviews from Mexico with a gay group, and we would do uh, because of the cell phones, we were doing live feeds from Mexico City. It was a it was a really exciting time, but it was time to to move on. Very good. So now this question is for Michael and Vanessa. Um, we kind of heard about the, the early days and some, some barriers and issues. So my question to you is, as I put in quotes, newcomers, relatively newcomers to Dallas, I would like to hear uh, and show the audience your perspective on barriers or issues that you faced more recently as you were, especially uh, becoming an activist in, in uh, Michael in, in the Oakland crime issue. And then, yes, you know about starting uh, uh, an organization for people of faith and uh, LGBT uh, religious community issues you may have faced. So, Michael, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Yanessa. Uh, I've been in Dallas for a little over three years now. I moved from Austin, Texas. I had my family, uh, friends that I handpicked, and they were predominantly uh, my Latino family that I had picked. My stepfather is white, so. Growing up, I was essentially Americanized to the point where after my great-grandmother passed, um, we stopped speaking Spanish, and my, my grandmother only spoke Spanish to my other aunts. And growing up in that town, I never really had a viewpoint of, of what my life was at the time. This is just what it was, and it wasn't until I actually began dating as an adult in Austin, and all of my friends were Latinos. Um, that there was a very stark difference to their backgrounds and how they acted when they got together and then when I got with them. I felt very out of place. I wasn't them, I was an other, but I was them. We all came from the same place. Um, and it, it, up until then, I predominantly dated, dated white people. And it, it, yeah, I remember this one guy, we weren't dating, we were casual or whatever, he, we were drinking. And he's joking and kind of making fun of my lack of speaking Spanish. And that's something that I really hold dear because to me, you know, growing, 
growing up and, and feeling that that part of my culture was kind of stripped away from me, I, I take that. It, it's, it, I take offense when someone questions my Latino-ness just based on something that I have no control of. So he's joking, he's laughing, and he was like, oh, you're not even really uh, Mexican, you, you don't even speak Spanish. Uh, he said, y'all all want to be white anyway, that's why y'all all marry white people when y'all come over here. Needless to say, that's the last time that we ever spoke. <laughs> but I remember having that conversation with my friends, and it was, you know, just kind of those things that I, we, I made very consciously not to ever put myself in that situation, but it stuck out with me. And when I moved to Dallas uh, a couple of years later, um, as a newcomer from the outside, you're looking in, and you see subtle segregation. Uh, decades uh, worth of segregation where groups of people begin moving almost naturally because that's just the way that it's been for so long. I remember walking into JRs and looking around and I'm like, one of these things is not like the other. Like, <laughs> it's me and three other people that even are remotely shades of brown in here. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Leo and so by nature I'm outgoing and I'm, I know nobody in the city at this time. So I'm, I'm going around and I'm asking, hey, you know, what's up? Can I buy you guys a drink? What's going on? And when I tell you the look of just like, why are you talking? No, we're good, we're fine, no. Um, I found one person that would talk to me and I said, you know, where, where, where do I go? Um, what are some good bars here? You know, I've only been here a couple of weeks. And I remember he gave the rundown. He was like, you know, you've got Woody's, which is the sports bar, and that's cool, you go, you have a drink, it's not really a dance club, JR's where we are now, you come and everybody just kind of pre-drinks before they go to the bar, and TMC has electro music, and S4 is where the drag queens go, and Roundup is the country bar, and Havana, well that's the ghetto club. And I said, what, what do you mean Havana's the ghetto club? And he said, well that's where, you know, and he wouldn't say it, and I said, well what do you mean? Well that's where, the, you know, the Mexicans and the, the blacks hang out. And I said, oh, okay, sounds like a good time to meet me. What, what makes the ghetto? And he was like, I, I don't want to get into it with you. And over the next couple of months, it was that attitude that I continued to encounter amongst the gay community here in Dallas. And after my attack, I remember being extremely vocal about safety and issues plaguing Oaklawn, and uh, at that time, what many of us as, as survivors perceived as um, the incapability by DPD, whether or not that was an accurate assumption as a survivor, you want answers. And so, you know, I was very vocal about things and what we wanted done, and what we wanted tax dollars allocated and things, and a majority of support that I was getting in my private messages was from black and fellow Latinos. And the amount of hatred that I was getting from the white gay community boggled my mind that there were messages like, you know, you, the guy should have finished the job, you're trying to shut down the bars, and you know, no one really cares, you're gonna be forgotten, I'm tired of seeing your ugly face on TV, why don't you just go away, if I ever see you in the bar, I'm gonna you know, tell you what I think about you, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm just trying to make sure that this doesn't happen, at some point somebody doesn't turn up dead. And then as I began getting more vocal about intersectionality between the Latino and the black community, it intensified to the point where racial slurs were being hurled at me, you know, because they see me on social media, and my boyfriend at the time happened to be, be black, and the majority of my friends were black and Latino, and I was called an inward lover and a race baiter, and these were from people that I knew. I, I see your profile on Grindr. I see you at the bar. I know who you are. Um, and I, I, I don't care. I continue to post about things and I would call people out and it, it just intensified and it, it got to the point where it almost became a rallying cry for me that it's like if I really wish that you could see that the, the, the private messages that you were sending somebody only further validates the stance that I am getting. And I've continued to have conversation predominantly with my fellow Latinos because I feel that looking back on my childhood, there was a lot of prejudice coming from my fellow Latinos. And whether that was cultural, whether that was where we grew up, I very much remember the N-word being used 
on my mother's side of the family, and I remember, you know, just little jokes here and there. And it saddens me a little bit that whenever I bring it up, I am almost met with a little bit of, uh, no, 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 we don't have a problem. We, we're, that, that's not for us, that's not a conversation. And I think that it's almost like the next generation of activism for young Latinos and, and, and blacks and gays my age needs to be that next frontier of equality, which is intersectionality. And the right. more that I speak on it, I find that a lot of the white gays that are my generation are the ones that have a problem with it. It's not the older generation, because the older generation pushed through those barriers arm in arm with queer trans women of color, and they were the ones that stonewalled that through the first brick, and so they're used to that working hand in hand. But that narrative is, has been hijacked by, by the, the younger generation to fit the narrative that they want to push, and that's where we get a lot of the pushback. And so it's almost like you said, it's like the work that you had done generations before to further yourself as a Latino and as a gay man is now being jeopardized because the new fad is to be equal but separate. And this whole new thing of gay Republicans and gays for Trumps, it's like, I really wish you knew what our history was because it's, it's what you're doing is, is disgraceful. So um, that's just in the three short years that I've lived here in Dallas, it's kind of accelerated <laughs> my, my activism. It's gotten to the point where there's no, I'm not shutting up at all. Thank you, Michael, for, for being a Leo and being a Hoshi for everything you do. Uh, my, my story here, I came to Dallas in 2001 uh, to work. Uh, I was focusedly uh, working, uh, traveling most of the time, so I didn't have the time uh, for probably seven, eight years to really engage in the society of Dallas because I was in an airplane and I was a single mom with one son and the little, little time I had to explore my social life was very limited. Uh, I knew a couple of women uh, and a few uh, co-workers who were gay and who told me about um, Caliente and who told me about Cathedral of Hope uh, but uh, I, was, I was not into social life. Uh, uh, I, I didn't have the time, uh, honestly, to, to, to do anything more than work. Uh, but I do remember my, my first encounter with the social life, uh, LGBT social life, uh, Latino. It was a uh, little bit before I, I encountered with not just Latinas, we was uh, an initiative of a Mexican uh, woman uh, named Ana Polo. She put together this group uh, to get together once per month, uh, mainly uh, women and men, uh, gays, and we gather in different places uh, to, to really get social, to have a space in which we can drink, we can talk. And there was uh, that plays a role, an important role to meet people and to be in a space that was welcoming, a little more uh, close than what it was to go to Caliente. That was uh, a good space to dance, but uh, we didn't have the chance to really develop good relationships uh, out there. Uh, in not just Caliente, so through uh, not just Latinas, I, I was able to uh, met my, my partner, who has been my partner for eight years, not a, who, is, who is here, and through uh, meeting her, I've been uh, with the desire to be in a, in a formal relationship with the woman I love. I became committed to uh, be more systematic in Cathedral of Hope. Uh, I found uh, a great space in the church. I, I was raised Catholic, but I always been uh, a, a spiritual person, so I was not ready to be a pastor by then, uh, but I found Cathedral of Hope such a great place uh, for my own healing and for the healing of others. I found uh, a space in which I was accepted. Uh, I, I didn't have to carry any more the guilt and the shame that I was feeling from the Catholic tradition. Uh, and then you start to find an interest in, in, in being volunteer and to help others and to serve the community. 
So for me and, and for many others, uh, I found that Congregación Latina, especially the Latino congregation in which uh, uh, I have been since then, has, has played a, pretty, a crucial role for, for the Latinos because coming from a Catholic, uh, and by the way, when, uh, when one of you say about the accent, my English accent was better because my, my partner is Spanish, and we talk Spanish every time. So I think I'm going to die with my, my, my Spanish accent. So. Uh, it, it has been the opposite for some of the kids. <laughs> so um, even though I study in English and, and all of that, but, uh, it's, it's what you're used to. Anyway, so going back to, to my experience here, Noche Latinas uh, disappeared, unfortunately, but uh, I have found a community of faith, a community of LGBT people uh, that are interested in God, and we have created kind of that space. Uh, some of the of the members, older members than me, uh, in fact, Alberto Rodriguez was here, but uh, uh, Congregación Latina has been uh, for almost uh, 20 years, you know, being in a space of collaboration with other institutions, being in a space uh, of healing, of uh, of emotional support, spiritual support, and I found that, that there is a lot of things to be done. Uh, uh, we have experienced discrimination uh, in various occasions within the same church, but also with, uh, in, in, we have improved tremendously over the years in that regard. I think right now we are more in alignment to be more in, in collaboration and in acceptance for our Latino uh, Latino being, Latino experience and culture, we embrace uh, with all the proud what is to be Latino. And in previous years, um, not that that was not the case, but I think we felt that there were not enough resources to really allow us to be in the way we are. So we have a lot of things to do, and I think uh, the point that you mentioned, Michael, about intersectionality, uh, we, we, we live in, in this in this world in which we cannot say, no, we are this or we are that. Uh, different aspects of, of racial or social or ethnic or, or even language or even the way we look or even the, the, our migratory conditions, we face that all the time. Uh, our Latino congregations is for so many illegal and documented people that we have to face what exactly is for, for them to be in this society as an LGBT or as a regular human being. So, uh, and many things that I can say about the, the, the importance of that space for uh, any person as a single individual, but also as a way to, to create a safe space for uh, LGBT and their families. I love to see people be in a space with their family and they say, oh my gosh, my son is loved by God and I am here worshiping God in a, in a space. I mean, that's incredible, important, and transformative for us. Yeah. And, and, and you've noticed, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and you've noticed that, that Michael talked about, you know, Pentecostal and Ines talked about her faith. There's a question about faith that we're getting to, but I just want to, to kind of, I guess, underscore that, that thread of faith and religion, because I think when you talk about the Latino community, Latino community, you can't really separate it. I mean, it, it, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. We'll get to that question in a second. But, um, Jesus, you were talking earlier about the um, network of Hispanic communicators and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and I've been active with the Dallas Hispanic uh, Bar Association. Uh, you, you know, Dallas has a very active and vibrant Latino community. Um, um, and I'm talking about Dallas kind of in, in general, not just LGBT. Um, and in fact, uh, Oak Cliff has a very, where we are tonight, uh, has a very vibrant and active uh, Latino community. Um, so, so the question is, um, what has been your experience um, of being an LGBT Latino in the Latino community at large. So, so how is that um, acceptance, um, inclusion um, been? Uh, and and I'm going to start with you because you, see, you brought up a couple of, of, of organizations, of, of Latino organizations, and, and LULAC. I mean, LULAC is a perfect example. 
the, the Rainbow Council is, is something that was specifically created here, and now there's 13 or 17 of them across the country. Um, and, and you mentioned um, GI Forum, I mean, there's Malda, there's a bunch of other, uh, you know, Puerto Rican Legal Defense Education Fund, and there's a bunch of Latino organizations. And so, so kind of the intersection of LGBT and Latino at large, what has been your experience, your experience, um, your, your uh, background on that? So let's start with Jesus, and then we'll come to Michael, then we'll go to Zay. And we'll, now, I want, I want to do Yonessa after, after uh, Jesus, yeah, yeah, Jesus first, because when we start the religion question, which is next, I want to start with you. <laughs> well, when, um, when I mentioned that I, <clears throat> I didn't have anywhere to go, there was no gay Latino organization, and I didn't feel the um, uh, DGA was, was, uh, was helpful, I, I did join LULAC, and um, in fact, I, I was, in fact, helped form an organization, uh, a, a chapter, 4863. Everybody knew it was gay, it was not a problem. In fact, there were a couple of members, uh, a couple of members of our council that were gay. And, and the, the leaders of the Gay Lulac, whenever they would refer to us at that time, we're talking 1980, 81, they would refer to us as the Pink Council. You know, and I, you know, that's what they would say, even though we wouldn't have a gay, <coughs> a gay uh, Lulac organization. But, you know, I, don't, I never found any problem. Um, the um, Network of Hispanic Communicators, when we formed that back in 1981, uh, everybody knew it was gay. In fact, the president of the uh, organization, uh, uh, Maggie uh, Rivas, she was a reporter for the Dallas Morning News and WFAA, uh, she was getting married, and they invited me to the uh, um, bridal shower. What is it when the women are getting married? Is they call a bridal? No. Bridal shower. I was the only guy there, so. <clears throat> but anyway, it was. Um, I've, I've always, always found acceptance when the uh, when I started the Virgen de Guadalupe show. Everybody knew it was, you know, it was gay. There was never, never, ever a problem. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it was acceptance. I think gay people, because I was out, you know, didn't have any problem, and um, and, and being and coming to to events that I was doing. When I was on the radio, um, you know. Okay, we were having parties. I mean, we were doing the Tayet, the Rock, uh, Media Noche in Babylonia, because uh, I was getting all these ideas from Mexico City. And the, the, uh, the, the parties that we would have, sometimes 500,000 people, it was a mix of gay, gay Latinos and, uh, and, and, uh, and straight uh, Mexicans. So everybody was mixing. It was, it was really, really interesting. Um, I know that... Um, when straight Latinos would, would refer to my radio show, because it went from a talk show to a radio show, but on the 20s, we would do gay news. So, I mean, you knew it was gay. So, it was, um, but and then the people, straight Latinos, um, Mexicans, would refer to us, oh, it's a great radio show. Everybody's gay, you know? <laughs> And so, um, so anyway, I, I never, never, never had any problem. Uh, I think the, the Latino community especially has, um, has changed. And one of the things when I did retire, I moved to Mexico City. And I want to include this because a lot of people sometimes think that Mexico is really macho, and, you know, that you know, the gay people are not accepted. Let me tell you something. Uh, Mexico had gay marriage and gay adoption back in December 2009. They had a way before the United States. So they have a gay parade in Mexico City where a million people, a, mix of, a million Mexicans are, you know, marching and protesting down the street. And, you know, and so it's very acceptance and it's very really accepted there. So even, even though it was moving around with the straight community here, I, I don't find any difference here that I do in, in, in Mexico City. I find a big acceptance. Um, I mean, every now and then, when I was on the radio show, people would call, um, and they wanted equal time, you know. And you know, and I, I would tell them, I said, "Well, there's no equal time here," and hang up on them. <laughs> You have your own radio shows and stuff. This is only two hours one week, you know. Give me, give me, a, 
give me a break. So anyway, so I mean, we would get that every now and then. And I used a P.O. box, and sometimes I would get hate mail. But I got a lot of love letters. I mean, we got a lot of, uh, one of the things was good was that we had a lot of people that said that they, they were glad I was there. And when I went, when I went off the air, uh, my last night, I remember this young man called, and he's, um, he said, you know, every Sunday I look forward to listening to you because, um, <clears throat> because I, I knew you were one of you were one of me, and now you're going to be gone. I don't know what I'm going to do. So, and I will say this: when Hastings talk about his art gallery over on Bennett, which is in my council district, if I might add, <laughs> the best day of day exhibit that I've ever been to, Hastings, was the one you did. Do you remember? <laughs> it, it was fat, fabulous. So it was a great. Uh, a great art space. Um, Vanessa, let me have you answer the question in terms of what has been your experience um, of being a lesbian in the greater Latino community uh, here in Dallas. Well, uh, I find that Dallas is really gay. <laughs> I mean, in the, in the sense that the visibility of lesbian is way less than the visibility of gay, is what I mean, you know? It seems like, uh, maybe because the history, maybe because the, the place where I am surrounded, I know that there is, you know, uh, swelling, and we have some, uh, like the chick happy hours. I remember they are still men, and I, I don't go there anymore, but it, there is this gathering of women uh, that meet every month. But at, at large, I find that uh, I mean, gay are so vibrant and, and so visible that uh, lesbians here, I don't know, we are somewhere uh, and we are in places. <laughs> but comparing with gay, I mean, that's my experience, you know, as a lesbian. Uh, as a Latino lesbian, uh, uh, to have uh, Lupe Valdez, you know, it's, it's quite something. So I'm really um, praying that she, she can. Uh, but that's, that's pretty much what I feel. I had felt uh, some comments uh, of people that uh, gay, gay men that kind of bother me in a way because you are expecting to see, uh, you know, boundless collaboration between gay and lesbian. But I have experience, and no, no, not all the time, but I, I was shocked the first time I heard uh, some some gay uh, people that I know with some comments about, oh, you know, lesbian are bushy, lesbian are, uh, they, they, they believe they this and that, you know, comments that make me feel like there is some kind of rejection, yeah. you know, between us. And, and it's something that maybe, maybe it's all over the board, but that is definitely an issue out there that uh, requires our attention and requires uh, our intentionality to really make us feel that we are the same. We are people uh, that are subject to, to many uh, unjust conditions in the society, and we as, as uh, LGBT people should be very, very aware of the different layers in which we can uh, kind of reject each other, so. Sorry, the Spanish-speaking community was uh, a little of a hurdle for me. Although I am bilingual, I'm fluent. I almost have a master's in the language, but I'm rusty. But I can still speak and carry on the conversation. Um, <clears throat> I think I didn't have as much trouble when I decided to run for office and, and do that whole process because I had one been a teacher of their children. And number two, I was bilingual. And that broke a lot of ice. Folks, I heard this at the Texas Education Agency years ago. If you're monolingual, you are diseased. So don't get diseased. You have to learn another language. And that is a big problem that we're facing right now of not understanding and knowing one another in these communities. He didn't run. I mean, the bitch dropped everything, went to Mexico, and immersed herself, and then came back speaking Spanish. I was amazed. I mean, 
Uh, or you can take it and say, yeah, I absolutely do have it. What am I going to do with it? Um, I was scared coming here. It's like, how, how would I fit in? Um, what could I possibly contribute to the conversation? How, because my, the Latino community that I've kind of moved in the past 12 years have been other queer Latinos. And so I haven't really had to change much of myself um, because they, they, they knew me, they accepted me. And then, you know, here in Dallas, I've made a handful of Latino friends and I've made a very conscious effort in the last couple of years, particularly after my incident, to engage with more of that community, engage more with my people, and kind of move away from this internal struggle of am I good enough or am I going to fit in? And the only way that you're going to do that is when you throw yourself into the deep end and you teach yourself to swim. And so I really, there's a couple of people here that were some of the first ones to come up to me during town hall meetings and group discussions and introduce themselves. Um, and, and through that, I have met some amazing people. And the only thing that I will say is the, the question of what is your experience like in the Latino community should be the same question as what are your experience like in the black community and the Asian community. Because the only reason we're minorities is because we allow ourselves to be minorities. If you look at statistics, Latinos are the fastest growing demographic in Texas, but why are we waiting for the inevitable to happen when we have the voting power? Why not reach out across lines and talk to other marginalized communities, get to know what affects them? Because I can guarantee you, the same economic issues that affect our Latino community are affecting our black brothers and sisters, yeah. they're affecting our Asian brothers and sisters, and the people in power who are benefiting from a system of oppression yeah. continue to benefit because we accept the position of minority and things are just the way that they are. We will become the majority with leak arms and say, okay, cool, what issues affect you? What issues affect you? Those affect me as well. Let's get to the polls together and vote these people out so we can change some stuff. about changing demographics, and that's going to be a question after this next question. So, Sorry. Yeah, these are like, like, you know, they're, they're reading ahead. They're, 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 they're cheating. So, uh, the next question is one about faith. So, so you know, the two things I'm supposed to talk about is politics and religion. So we've already covered politics a little bit, so let's talk about religion. And um, I think the myth, uh, and some of it's reality, is that, you know, most Latinos are Catholic. Um, um, and, but even if that's not the case, many times the teens, whatever their faith might be, as they're coming out, that experience seems to uh, be in contravention or contravene with their, what they kind of learn on Sunday. And so, so my question is, and, and like I said, you already mentioned about the safe space uh, where LGBT individuals can feel safe and be themselves and God loves them. Uh, Michael, you talk about Pentecostal. Um, you know, we've had discussion before about, about religion. So, so, so that, that's the question is, um, what has been your religious experience as you have uh, come to address, you know, your, your, your sexual orientation? And, and sometimes religion can help. And if you read about, you know, some of these, um, you know, conversion uh, camps or programs, sometimes religion can be damaging. So, so one of the like, individual experience, and yes, I want to start with you because I think on the panel you're the only one that's actually studied uh, theology and divinity. Uh, I may be wrong, but I want to start with you because of your uh, educational background. Yeah. Uh, yes, definitely. We have to learn how to be engaged again with the Bible, just to make sure uh, with the Bible and with the message from the pulpit, you know, because. Um, First, not all the Latinos that, that are here comes from Catholic, but uh, it has been in the last 30 or 40 years a, a big growth in the Pentecostal movement with the Latino uh, community as well. And uh, Pentecostal doesn't mean they are progressive or inclusive. They just feel the, the spirit, but they, they might have still the same uh, Message of the of the of the Bible as a uh, binary system in which you know we are created men and women and we are here to procreate and all of, all of the of the theory that we we all know. Uh, so the the importance of of being in in a, with an intention about learning about how to read the Bible again is because we 
we kind of learn how to discover what is behind those discriminatory messages that we have been learning since since the creation of Christianity. You know, uh, I believe it's extremely important to uh, to develop and to expand and to create more resources for uh, LGBT reading of the Bible in, in all the places. Uh, there is uh, spaces that are created not just to uh, theolo uh, theological seminary that are progressing, but you know, in, in Dallas we have different churches that are LGBT oriented uh, for the Latino community in Spanish, because you know we we raise here the issue of identity and the issues of language and who are Latinos. I mean, uh, I completely agree what you what you said earlier. Latino communities in Dallas or in any place. It is one community. We have many, many communities. And what we, I have seen is Latino LGBT are people who are also speaking in Spanish. And they don't feel that they engage in worship or engage in, in social relationship in the same way in English, not in Spanish. You know, and, and we have to acknowledge that. And we have to see, OK, there is here this need. Okay, but going back to the religious experience, uh, I believe a lot of Latinos are afraid to be in church because they still believe in their dogma that they, they were trained on that. And uh, many uh, LGBT-oriented churches have a, a big opportunity to engage not just Latino, but uh, the population at large because uh, uh, for, for hundreds of years, uh, the Bible has been used as, as the main weapon to be against uh, against freedom of expression, but especially against uh, same-sex orientation. So uh, I don't know how I can address this issue in more detail because you know, uh, did that response your question? Absolutely, and, and, and you could um, invite people to come to your your group or safe space, right? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you a chance to give a couple of answers. Pass the good work for the, you. The invitation is open. I, I feel extremely proud that we have uh, every Sunday at 1 o'clock a 100% Latino service. Because not just because it's in Spanish, you know, as I mentioned earlier, but we bring. Uh, we bring the co our culture, our Latino culture. Every uh, September, we put together a program that embrace our, our Hispanic heritage. And that's the spaces that we shouldn't be losing, because uh, if we want to maintain our Latino identity, we really need to be intentional, not just about the language, which uh, sadly, I think we are being losing. I mean, it is pretty sad that most of my, uh, my Latino people that I know here, uh, they barely speak Spanish. And, and, but let's like say, okay, I was raised here. It was, it was uh, against the, even against our safety or our recognition to speak Spanish. And, and they prohibit families to speak Spanish because otherwise they don't fit. You know, and I know that there is a history about that, but I came here relatively new. You know, I am being around people that uh, have been intentional about embracing their language and embracing their culture. Uh, even though I myself have to recognize, I I came to work for Verizon, uh, which I don't work anymore, and I was forced myself to speak English. Otherwise, I, I won't continue with the job because uh, my accent or because my work is in English. And that forced me to, um, you know, I, I was not engaged in the society with other Latinos, and I start talking in English to my kids. And I cannot regret that. You know, I regret that because we can be bilingual and be completely fully engaged with our identity, but also with our necessities in the society. So anyway, uh, closing that invitation uh, to come to church in English, 9 and 11, and in Spanish at 1. Very good. Michael, you, you talked a little bit about Pentecostal earlier. You're going to be in the son of a Pentecostal pastor. So what has been kind of your experience to me? intersection of religion and um, being a gay man. I, I want to preface this with uh, I don't, I, one of the things I'm working on is letting my brain catch up with how quickly my mouth runs. So I, I really hope that I don't offend anybody with anything that I say here tonight. But one of the things that I, I really, really learned, and I, firm, I firmly I want to preface this by saying I believe in God. 
Um, but I also believe God gave me the spirit to question every single thing that comes in my life. I used to get detention. I went to a private Christian school. I was in detention all the time because the teacher did not understand why every single thing we were learning. I said, why? That doesn't make sense. Don't tell me just because. Don't tell me because I said or because it's written here. That I need you to logically walk me through this because something isn't adding up. Secondly, I think in a, in, in a lot of us here, whether we grew up in Catholicism or Southern Baptist or Pentecostal, at one point, at one point or another, religion was used as a weapon against who we are at our core. And I'm at the point in my life where I feel like I'm more spiritual than committed to any particular religion because my spiritual journey is winding and it has led me to a lot of different religions. It has led me to a, a lot of questions. And I think that the sooner all of us who are, who are practicing any type of religion come to terms with the history of our religion and, and really understand that throughout history, organized religion has been used as a tool of oppression. Uh, the Protestants left the oppressive rule of the Roman Catholics to find America and then used the religion that they found to oppress women and burn women at the stake and in turn each new religion that is founded has used something in a way to oppress other people. Uh, religion was used to keep slaves under their thumb, and then over the course of hundreds of years of learning that oppressive religion, they are in turn perpetrating a cycle of oppressing people in their own community. And Catholicism now has been used to, to make us feel like, you know, being an, an, an unwed mother or, you know, being in a same-sex relationship is going to send us to hell. And I firmly believe that having a personal relationship with God transcends any religion that you subscribe to because at the beginning, that's what he came to earth for. Where I have a problem with religion and, and practicing indoctrination is when we forego the human aspect of it and, and use a written word that has been interpreted by hundreds of millions of people over the years and we use it to oppress other people before we even get to to know them. And I know a lot of people in the LGBTQ community are very affronted to religion because of that. Um, I, I love the fact that we have people in our LGBT community that are open to having conversation and very open and honest about this is why I practice religion and these are my beliefs and this is how I've coincided who I am and my sexuality with religion. <laughs> And religion may be an uncomfortable conversation for some, but sometimes the most important conversations that need to be had are uncomfortable because people have refused to have them for so long. At some point, you have to have the big uncomfortable conversation to break through the barriers that are keeping us, and then we come to a place of peace and say, okay. And I think the most dangerous thing is when you come face to face with somebody who is steadfast in their beliefs but cannot tell you why they believe the things that that is what's caused me to question a lot of things. And there are times that I find myself in church. I, I, I go to church. It's an amazing church. Um, I haven't been in a while and I need to go back. But I find myself questioning things. And it's why do I believe what I believe? Do I believe it's because I've had some event in my life that has caused me to sit and say, yes, I'm taking this all in and, and this makes me feel a certain way? Or do I believe because someone has told me for so long that that's what I believe? My father told me the sky is blue my entire life, and you come in and your father has told you the sky is red your entire life. And if both of us are sitting there screaming at each other, the sky is blue, the sky is red, and neither one of us are willing to listen to the other person, who's really wrong with that? We both are. So I think that when it comes to the topic of religion, uh, there are some really positive things to take away, but we've got a lot of strides to make if we're really wanting to include people that have felt like outcasts from any type of organization. Jose, do you want to go next, and then we'll ask uh, Jesus, because you were making notes on Bob. Microphone. Um, Microphone. Okay, got it, got it. I, I grew up as a Catholic. Um, I, I started going to church with my family uh, as a teenager, because as a child, there were just too many of us to haul around, I suppose, but as I grew older, that's when we started uh, going 60 miles every Sunday, Paris, Texas, to the Catholic Church. Um, they were great role models for me, and one of the things that guided me was the strength of spirituality and faith in me. Uh, I don't necessarily look at it as religion, and that is, uh, a, I could have been something else, but the faith and spirituality 
that Catholicism offered me as a Christian was soothing. It was strong. It was embedded in me. I felt good about it. And so good that when I went to the University of Dallas in Irving, it is a Catholic school, probably Catholic, um, and it also has a seminary there, and I almost crossed over and went over to the seminary. Uh, I made that decision not to do that because it was just um, I, I was chronicled here that I had said, looking back, it was the right decision. I knew I would always be in service to mankind, just not as a priest. Uh, I've always been a civic-minded individual. I don't attend Catholic Church anymore very often. Uh, I do on special occasions or with my family. Um, I am a non-practicing Catholic, but I am a very real, um, Christian, oriented faith person. Um, I did state in this, in its own record, that um, I have a problem with religious dogma and the church's view on homosexuality. I resented their denouncement of gays in the Vatican letter. Everything the church says about gay people is a lie. This pope has done more than his share of injustice in the world. Um, I'm still very much a Christian. Religious is something that, religion is something that has meaning in my life. And Chris, I brought this little example of what faith meant to me because if I did not have that in me, the spirituality, and you know this, having run for office, you faced all types of shit, let me tell you. I brought a letter that Councilman Stimson gave me years ago, and being a former teacher, I keep everything. <laughs> and this is all going to the, to the project. I'm going to put together this package and give it to you guys. But someone wrote Councilman Robert Stimson back in September of 1994. Dear Councilman Robert Stimson, I belong to an unnamed clandestine group of citizens who monitor the actions of public officials. We know the home addresses and business places of all council members, you included. Generally, our observations of your public behavior have been reassuring. However, of late, there have occurred certain actions on your part, part which have raised concerns. While we have no reason to believe that your sympathies lie with those who would threaten traditional family values, in fact, we believe exactly the contrary. Nevertheless, you have been observed demonstrating excessive and unwarranted friendliness toward the only openly and admitted sexual member, homosexual member of the council, Craig McDade. Perhaps you do not even realize this yourself. At gatherings of the council for news conferences, it seems that you are often choosing to stand next to the homosexual council member. The two of you have been observed cavorting with one another by making <laughs> private remarks by whispering to one another behind shielding hands. <laughs> we believe that those who would advocate and promote alternative lifestyles, as does Council Member McDaniel, pose a serious threat to the stability of our society. They are purveyors of the deadly AIDS disease. They want special treatment and privilege for themselves and their partners and they harbor tendencies to prey sexually upon young children. We urge you, Councilman Stimson, to be more cognizant of your public actions and to be sensitive to the message which they may convey. Your outward conduct is just as meaningful as your voting record. I needed God in my life to survive this. And let me tell you, I had my own version of something that was sent out in our campaign from no other than the state party chairman of the Republican Party. That's why I hate Republicans. Um, but they didn't attack me. They attacked the community. They attacked this councilman who asked me to run and to be their representative on the public school board because they knew the work I would do. But they said that I was running a stealth campaign and that the community was behind me with a homosexual agenda. Ah, it's crazy. Okay, Jesus, it's your turn, and then we got a little wrap-up project. Okay, um, well, religion, that's why. Well. I, I grew up Catholic. Uh, you know, I, I went to Catholic church and catechism and stuff like that. My parents didn't go, but they made us go. And anytime you didn't do something, it was a sin, you know, so. And so I grew up with that, and, and I knew when I was at least five or six years old that I was gay and I was different, but I didn't think that um, um, different or out of the ordinary. I didn't think about, you know, 
uh, held in damnation until I was uh, 14, 15 years old, and, and this uh, gayness was not going away. I even tried to pray the gay away. Uh, you know, when, when I was in high school in the late 60s, early 70s, I even joined the Jesus Movement because that was so popular starting in 1969 and early 70s. I became, I even witnessed and stuff like that. I even got a girlfriend and uh, almost got married, but you know, a, a, a guy had given me his phone number, so you know, I, ended up, I ended up breaking up with her and calling him. I'm not making it up. And so I went through that process and then I just lost all, all, all religion. And I don't, I think that a lot of our problems within our community and the world is because of religion. Uh, you had talked about the oppression. Uh, a lot of people don't really, you know, when they talk about, you know, how horrible the Taliban and ISIS are, people don't realize that the Catholics, when they discovered the Americas, but the Nan Cortes, brutalized and enslaved the indigenous people here. They killed a lot of people. They destroyed their temples, they destroyed their literature, they destroyed their art, anything they had to do with them. And so, you know, I, um, you know, so I, I, I don't really, you know, somebody who used to read the Bible and stuff like that, uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't follow any religion. I think it's a problem. I do find myself as being spiritual. I, uh, I don't go to a church on a regular basis, even though I have before. I, I, I know there's a, a, a power out there. I don't know what it is. I, but with the way I feel, uh, I can find peace and serenity in any temple that I go to. It doesn't have to be my religion. I, I often, uh, when I feel I need uh, closeness with God, I go to the Basilica of the Virgen de Guadalupe. And uh, she's a, an original god, the Tonantzin. She was a, a goddess of the Aztecs. And she made her appearance. Yeah, I, I, I have her appearing with my notepad. Uh, so, you know, in, in, the, in every year on December the 12th, I'm, I'm at the Basilica. So, I mean, I, 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 I enjoy that part of it. And, um, but I just don't find, I haven't found a church. I tried to go last Sunday with uh, Jose, but I just, uh, my dad's car is full, so I couldn't squeeze it in. Yes. But I don't feel anything bad about it because I know that, I mean, um, you know, God loves me, uh, whoever he or she is, and uh, when I go back to Mexico, uh, uh, I'll, I'll go to the Basilica of the, of the Virgen de Guadalupe and give thanks for, for, for having a good trip and uh, safe travel home. Excellent. Let me, let me just uh, say something to Jesus and the audience. Um, in Cathedral of Hope, we have a big uh, picture frame of the Virgen de Guadalupe next to the window of Esperanza and the LGBT. I think it's one of the places in which we have a hybrid, a true hybrid. Uh, we honor Virgen de Guadalupe, not just in her day, but you know, throughout the year. And uh, to maintain the belief of the people from Mexico, uh, knowing that Mexican is are the, the majority of the immigrants and the people here is is huge. It's, it's very important because you know they they like you just said uh, they have a, a faith, a personal connection with the Virgin, and they go to the Virgin to to implore and to have that. So to have an LGBT space honoring the, the Virgin of Guadalupe is, is is very important for our community, and you can worship with us. <laughs> okay, so, so there was a question about demographics that we don't have time for, but since I did some extensive research downtown at the U.S. Uh, Census Office, I Googled it, um, <laughs> here is the, the, the Hispanic population of the city of Dallas, and I, I, I say this because the reason why this is important is notice this growing trend. In 1970, the Hispanic population in Dallas was 7.5%. In 1980, it was 12.3%. In 1990, it was 20.3%. In 2000, it was 35.6%. In 2010, it was 42.4%. So in 30 years, from 80 to 2010, it tripled. And from 1990 to 2010, it doubled. It will be interesting to see what it is in 2020. Um, and, and, that, and that's just a growing trend. When I was on the city council, a colleague of mine joked, and he said, 
if I knew that you people were going to be in charge, I would have been much nicer to you. So, so it was a joke. It was, it was a joke. Okay, so here's the deal. You have one minute to answer this question. One minute. And it, it goes back to what Jose was talking about the book and the stuff he's given to the archives, which is why is it important to collect and share Latino LGBT history in Dallas and not just LGBT history? I'm going to start with you, Jose, because you only said you already talked about it. So you've got one minute. Go. <laughs> It's, it's going to be hard for me to distinguish between being uh, who I, I, okay, Chris, I'm an activist. I just happen to be Latina. I happen to be homosexual. I happen to live south of the river in Dallas. Um, I happen to be now a senior citizen. I mean, it, all those things just are just descriptors of me. Uh, I think if we need to get every piece of literature or, or any history that we have from whichever facet of our community because I think it is still growing just like our population is and it needs to grow intellectually and not uh, just things made up you know there is things like fake news so let, let, let's make sure that we collect everybody's story mine is very much mainstream it has nothing to do with the Latino community seriously other than the fact that I wound up being the sole Latino on the school board just because I happen to be, uh, or uh, you know any of that stuff. I, I, yeah, I, I thank you, Project People, for doing what you're doing and for working with UNT. I was going to ask a question though. In, is this stuff already capable to be found online at UNT? Yes. 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 Can you post that somewhere on your project page um, on Facebook or something as a link? Because it would be great to start seeing some of that stuff without us having to go search and look for it. Or I may not have looked well enough to find it. Sure. Is this one minute? One minute? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, well, I think it's important that, that we say uh, GLBT Latino history. I did want to say that I was a project uh, with a uh, 15 other Latinos around the country in Puerto Rico because, you know, our Latino history is often left out and, and not, we're, we're, we're invisible to the, uh, um, uh, really the gringo GLBT community. Uh, we, we wrote a book, it was published in August of uh, 2015, it's called Queer Round Voices and I have a chapter and talking a lot of these, uh, these things that uh, you can read about a lot of these things that I've talked about tonight. So I think it's very important. I did want to say that, um, I'm sorry that Rosa, Rosa Lopez, who was Lisbianas, uh, Latinas and Dallas, um, they had a, she, she was a leader here in the Latina community. They had the organization in 1995 and 1997. She passed away last year. And, um, yeah. And I knew she was sick, so I came in, uh, I took a plane, I, I paid Prime, Prime uh, ticket because I wanted to get her story. So I ended up doing a, an audio interview, I photographed her scrapbook and took pictures of her uh, before she passed away. And I put that all on a, um, a GLBT Latino Facebook page, it's called Remembering Recuerdando. Uh, and um, you can find it by doing a search that way, or you can search for me, Jesus Chavez, and I'll send you the information. But you know, it's very important because uh, if we had, it did not have Rosa's scrapbook and her voice and her story, it would have, it would have gone with her. And you know, and, and, and you know, it's so important that we, we. We save our, inf our information in history for the for the young people to know that it wasn't always so easy. Michael, personally, coming from somebody who has really grappled the past decade or so, feeling like a huge part of his culture has been erased from him, and now spending a majority of my adulthood trying to get that back and, and discovering my Latino side and. And, and my family, my grandmother and great grandmother has since passed. So these, my family culture and my family history is, is getting away from me. I think it's so important for us to be able to document and tell our own stories 
because there are so many people in power that are actively working to erase our history or to hijack the narrative or to rewrite it. Um, and I think you, you know, everybody, everybody wants to be a part of the culture, but they want to claim it as their own. And I think it's so important for us to be able to let our voices be heard and pass that down to the generations that are coming after us so they understand in a, in a political climate where they're trying to make you feel less than because of where you come from, or they're trying to make you feel less than because of the color of your skin, or the language that you speak, or how you came to this country, or how your parents came to this country. It is so important to let our, our, our people that are coming up back after us, that's what makes us strong, that's what makes us amazing, that's what makes our people proud. And we've got to be strong enough to be able to tell our own stories and to be able to tell our own stories. And if people don't want to hear our stories, then we've got to come together and speak louder and at the same time in order to force them to hear our stories. So this project is really fantastic. And I'm very, very thankful to be able to be a part of this today. Everything you said. <laughs> yes, it, I, I found uh, extremely valuable. Um, for, for all those reasons, and uh, I was uh, listening to my um, other panelists, I was thinking about the great success of the movie Coco, and what exactly Coco means about remembering who we are. This is just one simple, ex simple example of the importance to us tell our story. We are not invisible, we are here, we have our characteristics, and if we don't capture that, what is gonna happen in the future? It's gonna disappear, it's gonna believe. So we we need to have entities like this to really oversee and put uh, together many of these pieces and, and make a coherent uh, story of our lives and how important we are, how we are evolving, and how we are really adding so much value to, not just to the community, to the world, because we are amazing people. Thank you. So Terry Loftus, can you come up? Um, while Terry is coming up, um, Jesus is usually beaten to the punch. I had made uh, some comments about Rosa Lopez, and actually it came from your Dallas Voice column a year ago, um, and I wanted to kind of close with an in memoriam of, of Rosa. Uh, uh, Jesus talked about Rosa. Those of us who knew her and worked with her uh, loved her. But in 1995, Rosa and some of her friends founded Dallas's first lesbian Latina group, Lesbianas Latinas de Dallas, and their mission was to serve as a resource and support organization for the purpose of educational emotional, political, and social advancement of lesbianas Latinas. On Saturday, November 9th, 1966, Rosa and the rest of the lesbianas um, became Dallas's first LGBT Latino group to hold a major community dance at a prominent Dallas hotel when they hosted La Noche de Gala formal dance at the Harvey Hotel downtown. The event was very well attended. And regardless of your faith or religion or going to church, I know that Rosa is looking down and smiling on us tonight. So with that, Terry Loftus. Thank you, Chris. Can we have another big hand for our wonderful moderator, Chris Luna, and all of our wonderful panelists. This has been, um, this has been an amazing evening. Thank each of you for, for joining us tonight. Before we let you go, just a couple of announcements. Um, on April 5th um, at S4, from 7 to 9, we will resume our, our normal, our regular speaker series that's, that we started the Dallas Way with. Uh, and that will feature Dr. Wesley Phelps, professor of history at Sam Houston University, uh, who is currently working on a book uh, covering the legal challenges to the Texas sodomy laws. And he will be speaking, um, including the, the Baker versus Wade case. Um, that's April 5th at the Rose Room, doors open at 6. Then on June 14th, um, Candace Thompson and I will be moderating the Black um, Roundtable series um, that we believe will be at the American, at the African American Museum. Um, that information is on the back of your bulletin, so please join Candace and I for that. Um, in the back of the room, we are privileged to have with us Dr. Jarrah Carrington, um, who is with the UNT direct, uh, Department of Anthropology. And she is doing something very special that is very connected to what we're doing here this evening. 
She's leading a community-based um, oral history research project focused on the experiences, perspectives, and histories of the Latino LBGT community in Dallas. So if you, uh, yourself, or anyone you know would like to contribute any information, insight, and input to that project, please see Dr. Carrington and wave your hand in the back of the room. Um, and as you know, we have a wonderful relationship with UNT. We could not do the work that we do without their assistance. Um, and before I close out, I'm going to bring up Ray from LULAC, who is going to tell us about, I believe, their scholarship, one of their scholarship programs. And thank you, LULAC, for being our partner tonight. Thank you. And uh, 12 years ago, when we were starting first conceptualizing the concept of having the first rainbow or LGBT LULAC council in the country, we never thought as to exactly where we would come to. Uh, tonight, we were very happy to see in the, in the audience tonight, she had to leave with Jessica Gonzalez, our first uh, candidate right here in 104. Uh, she has no opposition on the Republican side, so she will be elected in November as a part of our family who will be representing us in the state legislature. So I just want to recognize that she was here. <laughs> but also, and it has been mentioned already, Rosa. Uh, wonderful member, someone that uh, big loss for our community. And also want to let you know that for the last three, I think maybe four years now, at LULAC, we have recognized uh, our leaders. Uh, one of them is seated here with us, Jesus. Uh, and also Rosa, and we've offered scholarships to LGBT youth in our community who uh, are graduating high school or going to college. And uh, this year, we're going to be able to offer $3,000 in scholarships. And if you know of any LGBT youth here in the Metroplex, uh, please have them. We have applications in the back. Please have them uh, complete an application and submit it to us. The deadline to submit is March 31st. Uh, this was made possible by the fundraising efforts of the council throughout the year, but then also uh, by a donation from Rosa's family. So it's intended as a memorial scholarship for Rosa as well now. Uh, so that will continue. And then finally, on May 3rd, that's uh, when we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo, uh, the, that'll be the seventh annual uh, council scholarship uh, uh, fundraiser. Uh, back in the back, Lex and uh, Sonny, our president, uh, we'll be glad to talk to you. We'll be glad to sell your table for 650 or you'd like to sponsor one. But that's how we're going to raise money to make sure that this, these scholarships continue going into that. Now, the partnership we have with LULAC, we have other sponsors that pay for the event. So every dollar that comes in for the table goes out as a scholarship next year. So please help us out if you can. Uh, we'll be glad to talk to you about it. And that's the announcement that I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Chris mentioned earlier that, you know, it, just because we were in a church, there wouldn't be a tie. But there <laughs> is. And I get to tell you about that. So. If this is your first time coming to one of our events, um, thank you. You can find out more information about the Dallas Way at dallasway.org. Uh, you can find us on Facebook by that same name, the dallasway.org. Um, but we could not do the work that we do without the financial support of our donors and the community at large. Um, so tonight, um, we'll lock the doors before you all escape. Um, we are taking cash, and we can also accept credit card donations. Um, we have um, wonderful board volunteers that will trip you when you're going out the door. Um, and all the money that we take in tonight will go towards um, the collection and digitizing of all of the information that we're collecting to chronicalize the history of the Latino GLBT community in Dallas. So all of the work that we're starting here tonight with this first series and everything we'll be doing moving forward, um, anything that you go, you're able to help us with tonight goes to that effort. So with that, on behalf of myself, our Chris Luna, our panelists tonight, and the board of directors for the Dallas Way, thank you for coming and good night.